I know you guys just had a wonderful lunch, but I still want you to guys to uh, imagine you guys going to a Michelin three-star restaurant right now. So as you walk past through the door, the restaurant is already packed with happy customers. You find a seat, look down at your menu, pick the couple of things you wanted to try. The waitress comes over, take your orders, and go all the way into the back order, the back kitchen. Now you're kind of stuck with this eagerness of waiting for that hot Sicilian food. At least they're gonna be for a while, right? So let's imagine what's happening in the kitchen right now. What happens to your order along with all the other orders from all the other customers? Here's what I'm imagining. The kitchen is very clean. It's very well organized. Uh, the head chef is heading the show, but the line cooks are many their own stations. They all tend to have their own responsibility there. And the communication style between the head chef and line cook is very concise and effective. It just makes it look so easy for a well-managed restaurant like this to pump out that few hundred orders every single night. How do they do it? So I recently re read this book uh, called Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. Um, so it revealed a lot of secrets in the kitchen, but I think what's important for me is I realized there's a whole lot of similarities between running a kitchen and building a distributed system. I can take a couple of quick examples here. So in Netflix, we have hundreds of microservices that works together to achieve a single goal, which is to satisfy our customers with the best online streaming experience. But when you look down at each individual microservice level, they all tend to do one thing, have one, only one responsibility, and that's it, and does very well, right? So if you compare this with the line chef, the work did by line chef has nothing innovative about it. The real job for them is all about that mindless repetition, to get that one ingredient right before packing to the next line chef. This is very similar. The communication patterns. So you might have noticed in the kitchen, there are more declarative style of communication patterns being used. For example, the, the, the head chef might say, give me two well-baked potato with skin removed. So on the contrary, you will rarely hear imperative statements like, go ahead, wash those two, two potatoes for me, bake them for 10 minutes, and peel the skin for me right now. Right? So there are reasons behind all these details. So today, let's all explore some of these deta details together. All right, um, so today's topic is running a massively parallel self-serve distributed data system at scale. So we're gonna cover what exactly is this real-time, what exactly is this real-time data infrastructure we're building at Netflix, why we need it. And the title kind of infers uh, we have two major challenges. That's exactly what we're gonna be talking about. One challenge is how do we actually build such massive parallel system at scale? The other challenge is we, it is a self-serving multi-tenancy system. So how do we actually make the system to cope with failures and also adapt to changing environments? So we're gonna go over those challenges and solutions and our principles. So what is this real-time data infrastructure we're building at Netflix? Um, with 100, over 100 million users, subscribers worldwide, we already have. And for almost any internet-connected screens, it's capable of play, uh, playing Netflix. So we actually, the entire ecosystem is generating a lot of events data that we actually leverage in the back end. Uh, so things like when people click on the play button, click on the pause button, so all those translates to events, and we actually uh, use those events for doing some other purposes. For example, we use those events for improving customer experience by doing better recommendation algorithms, personalization algorithms. And also on the content operation side, we do use those data for making a, a decision such like purchase decision, content purchase decisions. Uh, the list goes on. So on the other side, on the architecture side of the story, so with the recent rise of the event-driven architecture, uh, you might have heard 
you know, the notification pattern, event sourcing pattern, CQRS, which stands for Command Query Re Re Responsibility Segregation Pattern. Those are very, tends to be, become very popular, especially with microservices architecture. So it turns out building a real-time, reliable, uh, innovative distributed, uh, I mean, stream processing system actually helps uh, microservices to actually uh, allow them to better making innovations. So with the patterns we just mentioned, a couple of patterns we just mentioned here, along with the stream processing pattern, uh, traditionally, those patterns were implemented on top of enterprise application integration and enterprise messaging bus. So this implementation is proven to be real time, but it's also proven to be not so scalable, at least not to our scale. On the other side of the story, the batch system is proven to be very, very scalable. You can run a very large amount of data and do analytics on top. But at the same time, everybody knows about it. It typically is a results in a long wait uh, before the job finishes. So what we want to build is this streaming platform that allows us to be both scalable and real time. Uh, by now, you guys probably have heard a lot of the data-driven culture in Netflix. I'm not going to repeat uh, the sense in there, but I want to splash a couple colors into it. So because of this microservices architecture we have in Netflix, um, a lot of the teams tends to own one or more microservices, and they tend to need to make large amount of local decisions. So we want to empower them to make those decisions without having to consult a centralized decision-making process. So we want to be able to help them to consume any data they want across organizations, across technology barriers. This is where we want to provide a streaming platform that allows people to be able to consume the data they want and are also able to write the job they want to get the analytics they want. So what exactly is Keystone Streaming System? Uh, we help publish, collect, move, and compute event data in near real time at cloud scale. Keystone is a collection of microservices and components that can typically divide it into two different layers. The layer on top is what we call a control plane that does all the management, typically sort of like a head shift. Uh, the components on the bottom is more of like line chef, they do the heavy liftings and make the work happen. So we have the producer API, pop stop queuing system we build on top of Kafka, and we have the stream processing service. Uh, we typically uh, internally abstract the different stream processing engines so our users don't have to worry about the typical implementations of them. Uh, and there are cases where people do want to uh, write on top of a specific engine APIs, and we also do allow them to do that. Keystone is also a single self-contained logical platform as a service. So even though it's comprised of multiple microservices, to our user, it feels just like a single service. Keystone is a multi-tenant self-serving tool. Keystone is a self-healing cloud failure tolerance service, guarantees at least once delivery semantics. It's also adaptable to changing environments. So this is a high-level architecture for the entire Keystone. Uh, there are two boxes over here. The box in the middle left is where our router, the Keystone data pipeline architecture, where it handles uh, the entire Netflix data backend uh, that basically routes all the data Netflix generates, events data generates, and routes into the batch system and also feeds into the stream processing system. Uh, the box on the right side is where we want to set up the stream processing platform that allows people to hook into their own jobs and does the processing in real time. Um, so let's jump into the challenges and solutions we have faced. So the first challenge is scale. So this screenshot is taken from the Keystone Data Pipeline UI, where people can define how do they want to route their data either into a uh, Hive store, which allows them to do batch processing, or you know, routes into a Kafka cluster, allows them to, to do stream processing. Uh, the user can typically define a topic 
where they can hook up their producers to write into. They can optionally also to define transformation logic such as filters or projections. The filter we currently supports XPath filters right there. And projection will support both blacklist and the whitelist projections. Uh, so all this transformation essentially runs in the routing layer, which is a stream processing job. And eventually, the user can define a, a sync uh, they can route all these events to for their final processing. So after taking a look at the user's view, let's also take a look at the architecture side of a view. So this is the autonomy of a single string, how it looks like. So when the producer produces events into the Kafka cluster, which is the Kilon service over here, the stream processing job is responsible for consuming the payloads from the Kafka cluster, does the processing to the actual payloads, and then output to the sync. Uh, this is a normal case, but in failures, uh, during failure times, the stream processing job is also responsible for maintaining the states uh, by doing chip pointings and offsets management. So this is a more dive dive in view of the entire system, uh, especially focusing on the, the Kafka cluster, the Kilmi servers, and the Flink job manager cluster. Um, as you guys can see here, the, if you guys are famil familiar with the Kafka cluster uh, technology, it essentially allows the produce, producer to shout all the events and produce those events into different partitions. Uh, and each partition is essentially a commit log that associates each payload with offset message, uh, with offset number. So on the right side of the picture there, uh, uh, the router we have is implemented on top of the Flink, uh, Apache Flink technology. Uh, I'll quickly describe how Flink actually works, if you guys are not familiar with it. So Flink can be, uh, is composed of a job manager cluster and the task manager cluster. The job manager cluster basically does all the task coordinations, uh, does failure handling. So let's say if uh, one of the task manager goes down, uh, you will basically be able to reschedule the job into another task manager if it's available. Uh, the task, task manager basically allows uh, different, different uh, allows par parallel job to be uh, happening, that each one of these tasks is responsible for consuming from one or more partitions from the Kafka cluster. So as you guys can see here, the parallelism defined from the Kafka side is different from the parallelism defined on the Flink job manager, uh, the job. Uh, so this allows clear separation so we can scale the two different services independently. So one of the other things I want to mention here, so if you guys look closely at the first parallel task, it's a source operator that uh, consumes records from Kafka and runs this map function internally, map operator, and then generates output to the sync operator. So this is a massive parallel. Another term for it is actually called uh, impersonally parallel uh, workload. So that means this workload is actually uh, easily parallelized compared to some other workload, for example, my produce style job, uh, which reduce uh, sorting over the network and shuffling over the network. Uh, so those more complex style job is a completely different beast to talk about, so we're not gonna focus those here. It requires large local states management, requires chip pointing management, requires optimizations on data localities. Uh, so we're gonna continue to focus on the parallel cases here. A um, couple more things I want to describe here is uh, typically in a stream processing job, you want to be able to handle the back pressure. So in this case, you want the back pressure to be able to propagate all the way from the sink to the stream processing job. When it happens, when the, when the back pressure happens, you want that propagation to happen uh, from the sink to the stream processing job all the way to the front uh, Kafka cluster. If enough pressure is built up on the Kafka cluster, the bad pressure eventually propagates to the producer. You will start seeing producer drop the data there. That's what we want. Uh, and the typical way to enforce that is to, uh, there's multiple ways of doing that, uh, depends on the deliver semantics you want to guarantee. So let's say you want to deliver at least once semantics, uh, we want to be able to retry on those payloads indefinitely and to build up those back pressures. Uh, 
Okay, so we just briefly talked about separation of concerns. So we want to separate the messaging layer and the stream processing uh, service. So we can make each service to scale individually. And each service wants to manage their own authoritative states. We're going to get more into this as we go into the architecture side of the story. So we also want each service to independently manage their dependencies. So for example, Kafka cluster is built on top of, uh, deployed on top of EC2 instances on top of AWS. But on the other side, the stream service, uh, stream processing job uh, is a more natural fit to run on container platforms. So internally, we have this container runtime platform called Titus. It provides all this capability to us to allow us to run Flink jobs on top of them in containers. Uh, it allows us to do resource provisioning, scheduling, bin packing, capacity guarantee through capacity groups. Uh, it also guarantees resource isolation. Uh, they also implemented their own network drivers to uh, throttle the network loads. It's a pretty reliable solution for network isolation so far. And also, they provide this feature, which is very useful to us, to provide this per container IP address. Uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, port mapping resulted in service discoveries. Uh, so let's talk briefly about delivery and processing semantics. There typically, there are three different uh, processing semantics here. So at most the ones, at least the ones, and exactly ones. So at most the ones, just, so this typically relates to the fundamental distributed system problems. So network is not reliable, and this partitioning ha can happen at any point of time. So when, when your request time out, what do you do with it? Uh, so for at most the ones, it's a very simple solution. When request times out, we cannot deliver the data, you just drop the data. So the data delivery is not guaranteed. Uh, in Keystone Pipeline, we actually guarantee at least the once delivery. So that requires us to uh, manage our string internal states to be able to track those offsets. Uh, and during failure scenario, we need to be able to go back to the previous offsets uh, and re-deliver those events. And exactly once is a lot harder to achieve, but we're also going to talk slightly about those. So there are two different ways of achieving at least once processing semantics. Uh, one way is to do synchronous chip pointing through event lo loop. So event loop is overlay overloaded term here, but just bear with me. Uh, so this event loop I'm talking about here is basically allowing the events to reach the one processing thread. The one processing thread is going to do synchronous processing. So it's going to go uh, through process, event, event, and the checkpointing, which is a commit message individually. So each one, if each one of the steps fails, we just will want to retry the entire event loop before ma m m making progress to the next event. Uh, however, there are some slight variations to this approach. So certain um, I.O. bound workloads can be parallelized. But the idea is still be, uh, still be the same there. So if you, can, if you have uh, the user-defined task you want to be able to run in parallel, you can actually do those in the processing methods. But eventually, you still want to do the commit against this one particular batch to make sure uh, the offset you commit actually ties to this one particular batch only. So the second approach is called lightweight asynchronous snapshot. Um, there's a paper pub published for this particular method. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much details for this, but on a very high level, what it does is uh, the source operator essentially emits um, a chip point barriers at interval point, uh, point of time. So it allows this chip point to flow through together with the payloads themselves. So at this, when this barrier flows through the entire uh, direct asynclic job the diagram, uh, eventually will reach the sync operator. So when the sync operator actually does a commit, uh, those are the commit points when the barrier hits them. So I do want to mention there's a slight difference between at least exactly once processing semantics and at least the ones, uh, I mean exactly once delivery semantics. The processing sem semantics essentially guarantees even though this record we might be processing multiple times, but the side effect it caused to the local states, the, the, sta the states we manage for these operators, 
is essentially the same as we processing exactly once. Uh, the exactly once processing semantics typically is guaranteed within the system uh, where the barrier can be reached. So if you have a stream processing job that needs to deliver to an external sync which doesn't support this barrier or doesn't support unimportant operations, you will typically not get the exactly once de delivery semantics. But instead, this will revert back to at least once delivery semantics. Uh, so speaking enough about all those single streams, uh, so we do have per stream monitoring and alerting. Uh, this is a couple examples you know, representing all the signals we monitor. Uh, there's one thing I want to mention here. So when we do monitor our Kafka class and progress of our streams, we typically mon monitor the offsets we last to commit, right? So we compare those offsets with the lockhead, see how much lag we have. That indicates how much catch-up time we need to perform. Um, this is done externally by having a separate service to monitor for those offsets compared with the lockhead. Uh, sometimes there are different approaches by monitoring the Kafka. So if you actually committing the offsets into Kafka directly, you can also have the option to monitor for that uh, Kafka consumer lag metric. But that tends to be not very reliable because we can get very philosophical about this. Distributed system is like humans. They actually can lie sometimes. So what, what I mean by that is Kafka system sometimes, you know, if things break, the metric will be gone. It doesn't mean there's no lag, it's just you're not able to observe it. So it's very helpful when you have to have an external service that does monitor the lag. Um, so after looking at that one single string, let's look at a more complex scenario where we have uh, a final scenario here. Um, so as I mentioned, the Keystone data pipeline actually is a Kappa architecture style that supports both batching system and the real-time system. So we do currently support three different styles of sync. One is we directly write uh, the, payload, the payload events into S3 in a sequence file format, and the downstream uh, big data platform system actually picks those files up and processes them into Hive system. This typically happens within a couple minutes. Uh, we do have Elasticsearch sync that allow us to do some sort of log aggregation. Uh, and the third type is we do route uh, some of the strings into a Kafka cluster, which allow us to do stream processing on those secondary Kafka clusters. And the reason why we, want, why we want to do those, to have a secondary Kafka cluster, is we want to control our fronting Kafka cluster. So no arbitrary consumer can directly consume from the fronting. Um, so we have the full control of the system to make abstraction a lot more easy to do. Um, Failure scenarios, let's say the Elasticsearch cluster is going down. And since we're running a multi-tenant system, we don't want this one particular sync to affect all the other jobs, especially other strings writing to different syncs. So we want to have this logical isolations between different streams. How did we achieve that? Uh, I'm still taking the Flink job as an example here. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Flink job is comprised of a job manager cluster and the task manager cluster. The job manager you leverages Zookeeper for coordination and the task assignments. And the task manager uh, performs checkpointing by storing its local states into a remote state backend. And during failure scenarios, the task manager actually uses those checkpoints uh, to refresh its own state and restart from the previous checkpoint. Um, the way we want to isolate two different strings is to basically to provide different isolation paths pass for both Zookeeper and S3 uh, state backend. So even though Zookeeper and S3 services is actually sh uh, shared in a single region, uh, still, so as long as Zookeeper service doesn't go down, the isolation is guaranteed there. Uh, and this also applies to diploma, our diploma model. Uh, so imagine we want to deploy an upgrade to an existing job. So we want the new task manager we just spun up to form its own cluster without being able to connect to the old 
cluster job manager. So we also want to have isolation there. So this one step guarantees string level isolation and deployment level isolation. And uh, what about regional island, uh, island isolation, you might ask? So in Netflix, we have different three, uh, three different regions in, uh, across, across the world. So each region is in island mode. Uh, that typically means we have redundancy across those data, data centers. Uh, let's go more into this fan OK. So this particular event uh, is a very popular event in Netflix. Um, at peak hour, it actually has more than four gigabytes per second incoming data. And with all those fan outs, it actually generates more than 20 gigabytes out. Uh, I don't know what's the biggest the Kafka cluster you guys run, but for us, that can become a problem. So we need to solve that. Uh, and also, by the way, it's typically not recommended to run Kafka cluster more than 100 or more than 200 brokers. So we do follow that recommendation there as well. So the way we solve it is to using, uh, using hierarchies. Um, though what I mean by that is once the event is written to the fronting Kafka cluster, if the degree of fan all is huge, what we can do is we can route those events into a secondary Kafka cluster and uh, allow additional fan out to consume from that secondary Kafka cluster. So that way, we can scale the cluster a little bit better. Now, you might be asking, now, what happens if this particular string gets too big? So currently, it's 4 gigabytes per second. What if it goes over 10 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes per second? What should we do about it, right? So this only solves the fan out. What about that incoming string? Uh, so my colleague, colleague is actually working on something that allow us to spin a single topic across multiple Kafka clusters. Uh, I'm not going to go too much details into that. If you guys are interested, I'll provide a link at the end of these slides. Um, so we discussed a couple basic scenarios. So let's look at the total infrastructure scale. So we do, pro we do have more than 500 plus billion events generated every day. We process more than 1.3 trillion events, last time I checked, uh, per day. Uh, we have more than 800 topics, more than 1,800 streams. Uh, the currently, we have about 4,000 Kafka instances spread across about 20 to 30 different Kafka cluster wo clusters worldwide. Uh, and we currently have more than 9,000 stream processing containers that running, that's running stream processing jobs. So with that kind of scale, it's not hard to imagine that we need multiple fronting Kafka clusters to support all this uh, data. Uh, so even though I kind of blocked the names away, but you guys can actually still see, uh, <laughs> those are... Those are, we named those Kafka clusters after mountain range, range names. Uh, I do have a point, so you guys will see after a couple of slides. Uh, so with all these Kafka clusters I mentioned, there's more than 20, close to 30 to 40 Kafka clusters uh, across the entire company. So when the size grows, the only certain thing will happen is one of them will fail at some point of time. So we need to be able to handle the cluster failover. And the typical way for us to do this right now is when Kafka cluster goes into a bad condition, we've seen cases like uh, because of some network partition issues, we have partition issues that causes the controller to get out of sync with uh, as its own brokers. Uh, and there are some weird ZK issues which, which can be caused by long GC time. So all of these things can actually cause the Kafka cluster to go into an unrepairable state. Uh, this especially happens more when you run in the cloud. So what we do is when that happens, when we detect that, we spin up a new Kafka cluster. We route all the producer tra traffic into the new Kafka clusters. And at the same time, um, and at the same time we reroute the router to basically consume from these two different Kafka clusters. And the reason for that is we want to still drain all the data from the old cluster while still uh, reading from the new cluster there. So after some time, hopefully, the old Kafka cluster will be recovered and we fail back to the old cluster. That's how we do it today. Uh, that I need to bring up a concept here. How many of you guys have actually have heard of a pet versus cattle? 
Okay, great, awesome. So just quickly, uh, briefly talk about it. So cat versus pedal is this concept when uh, Randy Bass initially brought up uh, to discuss the different deploy model in data center versus in the cloud. So in data center, every single machine has its own name. Right? So when the disk goes bad or network goes bad for that one particular machine, the ops goes in, fix that machine, and then bring the service back up. In data center, I mean in the cloud, it's completely different. So when a service goes down on a particular machine, they don't try to repair that machine. What they do is to swap that machine out for exactly the same instance and run the same uh, software instances on top of it. Right? So that brings up a good point. So you guys remember the Kafka cluster I showed you guys? We do have names for those Kafka clusters. They all differ in sizes. They have different topics in them. Uh, so we also currently have this initiative. We want to make the Kafka cluster as immutable infrastructure as well. So um, this is just a vision. Uh, it's probably going to be another talk when we have the time. <laughs> So the, these are the principle with, principles we just talked about. Um, so when designing a large-scale distributed system, you want to be able to uh, treat all the failures as a first-class citizen. Just assume all the services can fail. Uh, even the data center can actually fail as well. Um, it does happen. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Uh, so we want to have separations of concern between microservices. Uh, you want to be able to scale them independently and manage them independently as well. So we also want to embrace immut immutability over there. OK, let's talk about the self-serve and the multi-tenant problem we have faced. Uh, the problem is we have hundreds of customers, if not thousands. They all have diverse customer requirements. Uh, they all want a combination of different features we provide. And they all have different platform trade-offs they want to pick. For example, uh, when there's failure, they want to, sometimes they, want, they, want, they have to pick between latency versus duplicates. We want to allow, be able to allow them to do that. So when in a multi-tenant system, change is only constant. So what are the changes? So when customers come to us, when they provision a new stream, they typically expect to be provisioned within minutes. Uh, and sometimes they will tweak, tweak their filters or projections or whatever custom logic they want to use you know, b just because they want to test in production. Uh, and also, there's scaling activity happening at all times. So when the customer comes in, we do initially ask them for some initial estimation of the, uh, the, the traffic, traffic volume. But as time goes on, this topic can actually uh, spike in traffic volume uh, to the point maybe that original Kafka cluster wasn't able to handle this. So internally, we need to be able to scale all our platforms. That includes moving this topic into a different cluster and you know, uh, scale the stream processing job to be able to handle the additional payloads. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, infrastructure upgrades can be happening. So for example, the tidies I was just mentioning, uh, is our container runtime. They go through bi-weekly updates uh, that requires periodical uh, container refreshes, essentially. There's also uh, requirements from our side to, uh, to, to upgrade underlying stream processing engines, for example. And majority of the platform team actually want to guarantee, provide that innovative and reliable uh, platform to our customers. So that means we move things really fast. Um, so that sounds pretty hard already, but there's more. Um, so there's different failure modes. So the infrastructure can actually fail. As I mentioned, um, the, the failure can happen at any level. Uh, the instance might be gone. The container might be gone. Uh, the uh, AWS availability zone might be entirely gone. Even uh, to the point, might be AWS infrastructure can be gone. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen um, sometimes. And also embrace that failure where any component can be temporarily un unavailable at any point of time as well. Uh, to solve the problem for customer to uh, have di diverse requirements, we want to be able to build all this uh, building blocks, for example, the, uh, the source operators, the transformation operators we just mentioned, and the sync, sync operator. So all those are composable operators that a customer can pick and choose. 
So let's get to the declarative reconciliation part. Um, I do want to give you guys a challenge first before diving into this. I uh, want you guys to think about why kitchen orders um, mostly immutable, means you cannot modify them in place. It's typical, uh, uh, typically append only. This appends to contracts, like leasing contracts and house purchase, purchasing contracts as well. Why is that? And uh, I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, declarative reconcilia reconciliation approach. Uh, how does that help us with scaling, uh, eventual consistent? Uh, and help us with less human interactions. Uh, and by the way, we actually, our team is only about 10%, and we need to be able to manage this entire infrastructure. Uh, we cannot afford having a lot of uh, human interactions with the system. So everything needs to be uh, automated. So declarative reconciliation, what is declarative? Declarative is a communication pattern that allows the control plan that does the orchestration and managing of the data plan. The reconciliation is a mechanics that drives the entire system towards its intended goal state. So let's talk about the goal states and current states, uh, and then we're going to take a concrete example there. So the goal states is something um, that the customer defined that they want to eventually achieve. Uh, and this can be break down into multiple smaller goal states for different components. And the, the current state is for each component to go out there and try to figure out what state is it currently in, right? So what does it help us with the goal states and current states? When a single component has its defined goal state, that means eventually it wants to go towards that direction. And it also has its current states. It can compare these two different states and compute the diff. So as soon as you compute the diff, you know exactly what you need to do to actually achieve that state. So let's take a concrete example here. So when the, cons uh, when the customer comes to us, it defines a particular string they uh, want to route uh, that typically just involves a particular topic, uh, the custom transformation logic, and the sync, uh, the, the, the sync where uh, they want the payload to go into. And they also come with some certain expectations, you know, low latencies, uh, at least once delivery guarantees, and all that kind of stuff. What the customer don't care about is where this topic is, which cluster it belongs to. You know, how do you run your stream processing job? What's the underlying stream processing technology you're using? So what we do is on the control plane, we break that simple goal state into multiple sub-goal states assigned to different components. And now things becomes easy, right? So as I mentioned, when the components themselves can figure out their goal states and the current state, they just need to perform this reconciliation uh, that allows the entire system to drive towards their goal state. Uh, and how do we do this reconciliation? Uh, it's natural to think of a state machines, right? So when we talk about goal states where you want to eventually achieve, and you have a starting state, and you have your current state, uh, this will allow you to allow the entire system to actually move towards that goal state. So this example of our deployment engine, uh, deployment workflow uh, deployed on top of the stream processing job. Uh, so it allows both the low latency and the low duplicate um, trade-offs that can be specified by the customer. Now let's also talk about some of the failure cases. Um, when you guide well, when you run a Kafka cluster, the typical source of truth for that Kafka cluster actually resides in Zookeeper. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but Zookeeper has been pretty bad for us, uh, especially in the cloud environment. So you probably don't want to rely on too much, especially in a distributed system like this. right? I mean, it's supposed to be reliable, but you want to add that additional layer of safety there. Uh, so what happens if the zookeeper goes away? Is this reconcilable system actually recoverable from this? I think we do. So as long as we store all the customer required goal states in our top level uh, control plan, persistent storage, durable storage, as long as those are durable and persistent, we can recover the entire data plan from those single source of truth. This also applies to the stream processing platform where the container runtime might be not available for some extended period of time. So as long as the existing running containers 
are doing their job, I think we're okay. The only problem is we're not going to be able to submit new jobs temporarily until they recover. So this reconciliation architecture also allows the single source truth to be enforced reconciling to the data plane continuously. What about the control plane goes away? So as long as the data plane is actually still running with the current job, that only means the customer cannot submit new jobs. We're still functioning correctly with the existing job. So uh, it is availability hit, but at least it doesn't affect the current job. So what this single source of truth allows us to do is to allow eventual consistent convergence on goal state. And this goal state is important because they are defined by the customer. So these are the principles we just talked about as well. Uh, we want to leverage reusable building blocks. Uh, we want to uh, leverage a single source of truth and declarative reconciliation to build the system to cope with changing environments and also tolerate to failures. Uh, now, let's, uh, you know, regarding that challenge I gave you guys earlier, so why do we, uh, why is the kitchen order and contracts those are immutable, I mean, open only. Uh, it's because humans are pretty bad at, at computing diffs, so they want to be able to quickly add that one append only stuff to figure out what's the diff there. Uh, and also a couple other challenges I want to give you guys, you know, after this talk, you can think about it. Uh, how many more similarities you can think of, you know, between distributed architecture and kitchen management? Does our principles actually apply to all of them? And that's it. Um, I think we have some time for some questions, uh, and I do have some references there, and I have to mention here because my manager asked me to. Uh, we're hiring. <laughs> cool.